Um, thank you everybody for joining us for um, 15 and 15. We're getting to the end of it, which doesn't quite seem possible, um, but we're joined today by Lindsay Page, who is going to talk about, um, I'm so sorry, I forgot the title, designing for inclusion, yes. <laughs> so with that, I will give it away to Lindsay, thank you. Thank you, let me share. All right, and I get to battle with the uh, the siren that's <laughs> the, the siren test that's going off right now, which should be fine. So um, thank you so much for having me and um, thank you all for, for attending. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so I'll be talking today about beyond access and designing for inclusion. So just to start off, I want to kind of ground ourselves in a couple of um, definitions. Um, I'm going to, there we go. Uh, so I, I'm gonna read this off just for accessibility purposes um, and captions should be enabled. So, uh, so feel free to click that on if you need to. So um, for a definition for accessibility, I went right to the Office of Civil Rights. So the OCR and at the US Department of Education defines accessibility as meaning when a person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally integrated and equally effective manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. And for visual learners, um, let me click on. Um, thank you, Hannah. Yes, I am an office of one currently. <laughs> um, Hannah Davidson has moved on to St. A's, which is wonderful, um, but bad for us. <laughs> so um, for visual learners to go kind of along with accessibility, I, I included this cartoon um, that some have probably seen before. Um, and this displays a person um, shoveling steps at a, um, I I'll go with school, um, shoveling snow off of steps. And next to the steps is a ramp. Uh, there's a wheelchair user that states, could you please shovel the ramp? And the person shoveling says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And again, the person rep replies, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So just another display of accessibility. For inclusion, uh, when I was searching for the right definition, I found multiple, as you can see here. Um, so I, the one that I chose to put on my, my handout is the second one here, but um, I'll go ahead and read the second one and let you read through the first and the last one. Um, so for inclusion, I'm basing on the ongoing and transformative process of improving education systems to meet everyone's needs, especially those in marginalized groups. Again, I got another visual and I'm sorry for the blurriness of this, um, but I will, I will describe it and read it to you. So um, depicted here is a cartoon and a picture of, I would say a professor type person sitting at a desk outside and in front of him are various types of animals. So there's a bird, a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, a fish, a seal, and a dog, it looks like. And the professor is saying for a fair selection, everyone has to make this take the same exam. Please climb that tree. I like to share this with, with anyone, um, but I like to share this with folks to um, get a sense of um, what we're asking students to do. And now students, are not animals, but they come from all different backgrounds and they're all different types of learners. Um, so I'd like to point out that not all of them can climb that tree the same way as someone else could. So next, I wanna just go through some examples of current PSU accommodations. And these are, I would say, one of the, some of the more common accommodations we have. Um, those are extended exam time, copies of instructors' notes, recorded lectures, extensions, captioning, and alternative presentations. So from this, I want to explore how you can incorporate common accommodations into your class and thus create a more inclusive environment for all. 
So big disclaimer before we start, I know that some of these are, or sometimes all of these won't necessarily work for certain courses. Um, but I just want to ask you to, to look at your course to see where you could potentially um, incorporate some of these. Um, Hannah and I used to always joke that we would love for faculty to kind of put us out of a job um, because they've, they've found a way to kind of not make some of the accommodations necessary. Um, I don't think it, you could put me out of a job, but um, I would appreciate you trying. <laughs> So when we look at extended exam time, um, that for many is a, is a hard stop that, oh, you need extended exam time, you need to leave the classroom to go do that. And it's very possible that extended time is not possible due to classroom scheduling um, and, and whatnot. So I acknowledge that there are barriers, but some of the things that I've found helpful just in working with different faculty and things that they've brought up is if you, for example, have a quiz, that is, that will definitely take most students five minutes to complete. Um, those faculty have found success in building in, you know, 20 minutes or more, knowing that the majority of folks will be finished, but the folks that might need that extra time don't have to leave the classroom and already have that extra time kind of built in. So it's kind of a, I don't wanna say easy, but that's a, that's a low, low level, low hanging fruit that we can kind of achieve that. If it's not possible due to scheduling, I've had faculty, especially with the pandemic, um, find flexibility in shifting over to um, to Canvas or an online model in order to achieve their exams and quizzes. Um, and that's allowed for students to be able to take that anywhere or from the comfort of you know their own space or whatever works and leaving that time either doubled or open to them also helps. Instructor notes and recorded lectures. This is like my new um, my new push to try and encourage folks to do this. And this is a hard lift. I don't want anyone to think that I deem this super easy and, and whatnot, but I've other institutions have been doing it. Uh, classrooms here have been doing it. So I, I definitely wanna challenge you all to think how maybe you can do this. Um, so instructor notes and recorded lectures. As the accommodation is stated on our letters that go out. It states that if a professor has PowerPoints as part of their class, um, they can share those PowerPoints with students that need it. Most professors that do PowerPoints I've heard are posting them on Canvas, which is fantastic. That already creates so much access for all students. However, there are some students that while they might have the PowerPoint from you, or if you don't use PowerPoints, they're really struggling to, to catch capture capture those notes. So some of the things that I've thought of and some things that I know other professors have done is setting up collaborative note-taking. Um, I've heard of students all using a Google Doc and kind of adding to this Google Doc and sharing or using OneNote to share those, that note-taking as well. You can always get a volunteer note-taker from the class um, or that can potentially be rotating. However, I suggest not rotating it to um, not rotating it to students, to every student making it mandatory, because then we're calling out the students that might not be successful at note taking. But you could, at low level, you could totally grab a just volunteer note taker. The other thing that could be helpful is providing graphic organizers. And I know some folks might think that that is more of a K through 12 type thing. Um, but what I've found, and I'm sure what many of you find, is it's really, uh, I, I think we have a, a missed link on teaching students how to take notes. So graphic organizers isn't enabling them or you know allowing them to not learn the skill of note-taking, it's just supporting their note-taking um, and good note-taking. So that's another way that might work. And that can be something that the class comes up with and builds together. It doesn't have to be all on you, the faculty member, to produce. Um, I think it would be even more impactful if it was a class decision to make a graphic organizer for everyone to support their note taking. With recorded lectures, you know, I our office can provide assistive technology that helps with recording lectures. Um, the student can use their device to record. 
but I've had some faculty find success in recording their own lectures and posting that to Canvas. And that's even post um, being remote. So I have some faculty that will pull up a Zoom and just record and post it on their Canvas after the fact, and that provides access. Again, it's a lot, that's more work, but it's not providing a Zoom link to the students, it's just recording yourself. Um, and that's been successful. The bonus is they can have captions as well, um, which is always very helpful. Extensions, another kind of low level, but again, acknowledging that I know it can be daunting for some, um, is building in some flexible due dates and deadlines. This is something that we often ask now um, for faculty, and most faculty are very accommodating, regardless of whether students have accommodations with this ask. But if you can build that in or scaffold and break down your big assignments and projects and papers, you're going to be supporting all of your learners. Captioning, <laughs> really simple. <laughs> Please turn it on. Please use it. Um, I would love to see, especially you know, when you're presenting. I've had professors that pull up just a blank Google slide or PowerPoint just to have the captioning up there for their class. Um, I'm always amazed when I go and present in a classroom and I have a PowerPoint and there's captioning up. The students are like, "Oh, captioning!" Like they're surprised by it. I would love for them not to be surprised and just have it as an expectation. Um, I don't always need captioning, but I find myself looking at it and I'm retaining it because I'm reading it as well as hearing it. And we have all different learners that can, can benefit from this. Um, please, if you haven't captioned your, your videos or they're not captioned already, um, I definitely encourage you to, to get those captioned through Kaltura Checking my time here. Um, alternative presentations. This tends to be more common. Um, all that I ask is looking at ways that you can provide multiple modalities for presentation. Um, think about videos, think about podcasts, infographics, artistic renderings, models, anything. Allow for choice where you can. Again, I understand that there's some restrictions of certain, certain projects, but I would encourage uh, different modalities if you ever can. All right, we're getting close to the end. I wanted to make sure I had enough time. So um really important barriers are in the environment not in the learner and um what i encourage folks to think about is when you get an accommodation letter if you can look at it as not okay this this student is an issue this this student is the problem that i need to fix but take a minute and turn to how can i adjust this in my classroom um, to support all of my learners um, and think of it more in a environmental space versus um, versus the medical model that we are kind of forced to to support students in. All right, um, that kind of wraps me up. So please feel free to contact me. I know Hannah mentioned I'm an office of one right now. That won't be forever. And but I am more than willing to talk to faculty, staff, anyone who has questions or needs support. I'm always available. And feel free to come visit in our, our office in Spear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you for coming and doing this. Um, when you are an office of one, it means a ton. And that was great. I loved, I mean, you crammed so many wonderful, actionable little morsels in there. So um, hopefully everybody else felt the same way, but I thought that was wonderful. Thank I you. will stop the recording.